Well, good morning again, everybody. Um, we are kicking off this new series about this New Testament letter uh, called First Peter this morning. Uh, we're titling it Thriving in Exile. And I want to ask you a question as we get going this morning. Have you ever uh, found yourself in a place, in a situation where you're like, I do not belong here? Have you ever been there? Uh, I was there a couple of years ago. I was invited to go to an Indy 11 soccer. I learned it's not called game. It's called a match. Uh, if Indy 11 is in Indianapolis, it's our professional soccer team. Uh, I, was, I was invited by some people that love uh, f- what they call football. But it's not football. Let me get you going there. Um, but uh, watch soccer. They were actually playing at Lucas Oil Stadium. And I love sports. I love live sports. I love basketball. I love football. I love uh, playoff baseball or live baseball. I love it all, but I walked in to watch this soccer match, and I had no idea what was happening at all. I mean, it's just not something that I was aware of. We got some really cheap tickets. We're actually at Lucas Oil Stadium, where the Colts play, but there's only like 5,000 people there, so it feels kind of empty, and then I just start like being so confused by what's happening in front of me. I mean, for example, they've got these things called cards. There's yellow cards and red cards. They're not fouls, and I don't know like how many fouls people have. I don't know how many cards they have, and red card, apparently you're kicked out of the match or something like that, uh, but yellow card, I'm like, so can they get a couple yellow cards? They get six and then they get kicked out. I was so confused by this. There's this offsides rule that I'm not even going to pretend to explain to you. I have no idea what was happening there. It wasn't like in football where you just like cross the line, you're offsides. So I don't really understand that. We actually, uh, uh, we were sitting in the area of the stadium called the Brickyard Battalion, which was like the fan club seating. Here's a picture of these crazy fans in the Brickyard Battalion. And I'm sitting there not even knowing the rules of soccer. And I'm like, they're chanting, come on, you boys. And I'm like trying to like, you know, saying watermelon, but not really saying anything, trying to act like I know what was going on. But we're sitting with these crazy fans that know all the players and all their background and all their tendencies. And I'm like, go soccer. I mean, it was kind of crazy like that. Another thing that's weird about soccer for me, just be real, like as an American sports fan watching mostly American dominated sports, uh, the reality of that, like, there's like a clock, but a lot of times the, the clock ends, but the game, they keep playing. There's no like last second thing going on. The refs arbitrarily or subjectively, let's just say that, add extra time that they play at. So I'm like, wait, I thought this was the end of the game, the match. What is going on? I just had no idea what was happening. I remember sitting there, and people around me were really excited, and I'm kind of like, I just don't know. Is that good? I think that's good. Cheer. You know, I just don't know. I felt like I was out of place. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you just weren't home? You were out of place. Things just did not make sense or connect with you, and you're like, I've just got to get out of here. Well, this month, as we're diving into this New Testament letter uh, called First Peter, written by a guy named Peter, I know, very creatively titled, uh, he's going to be talking to Jesus followers in the first century who were stuck in a place where they felt like they did not belong. <laughs> and there's going to be lots of parallels to our life today in 2021, uh, where we, if you're a Jesus follower, there are parts of our world that just should make us feel like we're not at home, like we're not in our homeland, and we wish that the world was different because the world we see outside is not the way that Jesus wants it to be. It's not the way that it's oftentimes described to us by Jesus. Have you ever been someplace where you didn't belong? Peter knows exactly what that's all about. But the reality is that this in-between season that we find ourselves in, where the world doesn't make sense the way that we want it to make sense, we feel like we're homesick, we're not in our homeland, there's a reality that we're going to learn over the next four weeks where we don't have to just survive, we don't have to sit on our hands, we don't have to act like victims all the time, but there are some steps that we can take, there's some things that we can know, understand, and then do that help us thrive in the in-between seasons that we find ourselves in. And and what we're titling in the series and what Peter talks about, the exile periods of our life. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next four weeks. And this morning we're going to spend, we got a lot of work to do, a lot of ground to cover, but we're only going over the first eight verses of this New Testament letter written by Peter. So we're just going to dive right into it. We got a lot of ground to cover as we go. So this is the very beginning of this first century letter written by Peter, who was one of Jesus' best friends, an early leader in the church, to Christians that were scattered all over the ancient world. It happened about 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. But here's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He kicks things off, says, This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as exiles in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
Right from the beginning, Peter says, hey, I want to let you guys know, hey, it's me, Peter. Remember all the stories from the Gospels, you know, me and Jesus hanging out. I got a lot of good things, some not so good things, but it's me, Peter. And I'm writing to God's chosen people, to the Jesus people, the church in this early, early season of their history. But you guys are God's chosen people, but you're living as exiles. Other translations say you're living as foreigners. You're living scattered about all these different provinces, all this diff- these different regions of the ancient world. So right from the beginning, there's a principle that's going to carry us through over the next four weeks. But Paul or Peter, who's starting out this letter, he's setting the stage saying, you guys are God's chosen people. You are the Jesus people. You are his church. But you're also living as exiles. You're chosen. You're uh, in God's family. But you're also living in this time and this season of exile. Peter is setting the stage saying that there is a dual citizenship going on. There's an already and not yet. There's this in-between reality that you are living in where things are not right now the way that they should be, but you are still God's people. This is our story as well, thousands of years later. But first, we need to talk about this word exile. What does exile look like? What is exile like for the ancient people and for us today? Here's what it Exile is. Exile is a season of prolonged separation from one's country or home as by force or by circumstances. It's being kicked out of the world that you were created for. It's, it's you being forced away from your homeland and your customs and your comforts and all that you want life to be. Exile is that season where you are separated for a long period of time from it. And let me say this, that God's people, the first readers of Peter's letter, God's people, the Jews, the Israelites from the Old Testament, they knew exile very, very well. I mean, God's people had almost always been in a constant state of exile. They were used to being exiles in Egypt when they were slaves under Pharaoh. They were used to being exiles as they were wandering in the desert looking for the promised land, not really having a home. They were exiles later from the Babylonians and the Persians. And then when Jesus gets on the scene, Jesus is born into this time where God's people are exiles to the Roman Empire. And that's actually the same kind of exile politically that these first readers, these first listeners were living in as well. So Peter is saying, yes, remember that you are God's chosen people. You are the Jesus people living in the world, the church, but you're also living as exiles. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. The theological term for this uh, uh, that I remember reading in college is that you and I, we live in the already but not yet period of history. The already but not yet Get a little, it feels like we're doing some time travel, right? The already but not yet reality. Here's here's what I mean by that. Already but not yet, Jesus is already king of the universe. Right now, he is king of the universe, uh, and he has all authority that is granted to him. All power is given to him. He is the king of the universe in everything that we see, but it is not fully realized yet in our world. Can we agree with that? Like that reality of Jesus being king is not fully realized and played out across our world. And so this period that we're living in right now, there's brokenness, there's sin, there's uh, you know, greed and systems that are broken and corrupt that are all going on right now. And Jesus being king is not realized right now, but it will be realized when Jesus returns and he sets all things that are broken to right. And we live in this in-between period. I think of it this way, in our American democratic system, there is an election. I was told the election is not just on the first Tuesday of November. It's the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, uh, every four years for the president. And then after the votes are tabulated, they are counted, there is a new president elect, a new president where he is going to be or she is going to be someday president of this country. But until January 20th, there is this in-between period before January 20th when they are inaugurated to be the new leader of our country. There's this in-between period between the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November and January 20th. That's kind of like how we are living today, where the world is broken. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And Jesus being king is not fully realized yet. That is where we are living today in the already, but not yet. Is everybody thoroughly confused yet, right? (laughs) This is this exile period that we live in where Jesus is king, but it's not fully realized yet and there's brokenness everywhere. 
And it's not like many of us, we are like living outside of our geographical homes the way that these first Jesus followers were in First Peter. But we all have our own version of personal exile today and different ways that we feel this exile of living in the already but not yet. I mean, we all live in this world and we don't have to take a lot of convincing or a lot of time for me to explain the world is broken. It's not the way it should be. There is injustice, there is pain, there are tears, there are disease, there is cancer, there are all these broken things that rob us of the life that we are called to live. Wrong things are celebrated as right and right things are sometimes shouted down in our broken world. It's this exile that we live in. Maybe for you, you're living in a relational exile where you feel alone. You feel like an outcast. You feel maybe your most important relationship, whether it be with your family or a spouse or a partner, man, you feel like you're on the outs and things are just not working. It's not the way it should be. Maybe you're in a job exile where you feel stuck in a job where you're like not using your skills, your gifts. You hate going to work. You can't stand what you do. You feel stuck in this exile period of your job. For some of us, maybe uh, you feel persecuted in your current state of, of your life because of your faith. Maybe for you, you're a Jesus follower, and you would say that you feel persecuted because you're a Jesus follower. Now, let me take a little sidebar here, just for a moment. Come right out of the camera view. Camera guy loves that when I do that. Um, in our country, we, we do not experience persecution like many other countries do. Jesus followers in some parts of the world have to gather like this, in secrecy, in basements, and they have to be hidden about it. Those are people that are experiencing tough, brutal persecution. We don't experience that here in our country, thank God. But I do want to step into reality that sometimes, sometimes we are maybe picked on, made fun of, maybe looked over for a promotion at our job because we won't join in with something that's going on with our coworkers or we won't play the game with our boss and say things about people that we feel like would be dishonoring. And so sometimes there are realities that we lose out on an immediate reality because of our faith in our world. So there is some sense of persecution, but that's part of us living in this already, but not yet, this in-between exile season. And what Peter shows us in the next couple verses we're going to look at this morning is, hey, you guys are exiles. The world is not the way it should be, and you're living in this in-between period, and it's hard. But I want to teach you how to thrive in this season, not just to survive, but to thrive in this season. And so you might be asking the question, okay, so what does Peter do to tell them to thrive as exiles? Does he tell them, like, here are a bunch of rules you need to follow, some religious rules or some rules of the road that you need to follow to make it through this in-between period, this exile period? Um, or maybe there's some religious activities you need to do. You need to do more of this. You need to pray more. You need to give more money away. You need to make sure your church attendance is bumped up quite a bit so that you make it through and you thrive in this exile period. You might be thinking it's about rules. It's about religious activities. But Peter surprises me. Maybe he surprises you too. And he says, no, it's not about those things. The real starting point of you thriving in this exile period of your life is to remember who you are and to get your identity right. That is the cornerstone, is to get your identity, your sense of self-worth right and where it comes from. If you get that right, man, other things will fall into place and you'll truly be able to thrive. If identity is such a challenging thing for me, maybe for you, uh, because there's so many different voices shouting at us about where we get our identity all the time, Right? You know, where we get our identity. Henry Nouwen, who was a, a Dutch priest and an incredible author whose works meant so much to my life, he said this about identity. He said there are three li basic lies that we believe about our identity. Lies about, that we believe about who we really are. I am what I have. I am what I do. And I am what other people say or think of me. We need to take that down because that's like too convicting for my heart this morning. I mean, like I, I fall into all these lies so often and maybe you do as well. It's easy for us to fall into this lie about our self-worth, our sense of identity comes from um, what I have. Sometimes it might come from the excess of what we have. We feel like, man, we're doing well if we've got more zeros at the end of our account number in our bank account, or we can afford that new summer toy that we want, or if we've always got a lot of money left over at the end of our month we feel like, yeah, I'm doing well. I've got this thing going. <laughs> or maybe it comes from the lack of what we have. We feel like we can't afford the thing. We're struggling, struggling to make it through, and we have to make tough decisions. And so we start to feel bad about ourselves, saying, I'm not doing very well. I don't have a lot. 
So we start to talk down about ourselves. I am what I do. This is easy. Whatever our job title is, it's easy to find our identity in what that job title is. If we feel like we're making a difference in our work, sometimes we can inflate our identity thinking that we are so important. Other times we look at the opposite side of I am what I do and we feel terrible about ourselves because we don't feel like we're making a difference Or sometimes we look at the negative things that we have done, those terrible behaviors and those patterns that we might feel stuck in, and we say, if I am what I do, and that's my identity, I do some bad things, and I just feel like I am bad. And we get into the shame cycle, just thinking terribly about ourselves over and over and over again to where we believe our identity is that we are bad. Here's the last one for any people pleasers in the house, and I know we've got none of those, right? Uh, But I am what other people say or think of me. I am what my public reputation is. This is the core of who I am, is what other people say or think about me. And Henry Nouwen says that when we live for the praise of the approval of other people and what other people say about us, man, it's just broke. It's broke. You know why uh, these three realities or, or these three lies about our identity, why they're so broke? It's because they are crushing and they are impossible to keep up with. They're, they're crushing because there is always somebody who's got more, who has a better reputation than you do, and that have, has done more than you. And so you play the comparison game, and you just feel terrible about yourself. <laughs> you know why you can never keep up with these lies is because they're always a moving target. You feel like if you get your identity from what you do, what you accomplish, what other people say about you, oh, man, you feel like, I, I can do this for a while, but next month there's a new thing that comes out that you can't afford. Next month there's a new business that opens up, and you don't have that title yet. <laughs> next month somebody else is being um, the one praised in public for what they do, and people forget about you quickly. They're crushing You find your identity on these things, and they just like fall away like sand through your hands. So that's why Nouwen says these are lies. I want to add one more lie to Henry Nouwen's list. I didn't ask him for approval to do this or anything like that. But this is what I believe that um, millennials, my generation, and Gen Z, what uh, another lie that we tell ourselves that's crushing, that is impossible to keep up with. And it's this right here. I am what my heart tells me. I am what emotions I am feeling right now. (laughs) I I am this self-actualized person to where if I can get to the end of what I believe is true for myself, then I will truly be happy and I'll find my identity. And oh man, this is, this is so broke, but it's so easy for us to believe. This is saying, I'll just follow my heart. This is the Disney theology, right? That sounds great in a Disney song. Um, it doesn't line up with the way of Jesus. And it honestly just hurts us because our hearts can be deceptive. We follow the end of ourselves and we find brokenness and emptiness at the end of the story as well. Identity is hard for me. It might be hard for you because it's so easy for us to fall into those other lies. And what Peter does over the next five verses is that he gives us a theological onslaught of an identity hit. I mean, he gives us like, he lets us know, this is who you are. Don't listen to these lies, these voices. This is who you are. And this is how you begin to thrive in this in-between period of this life in this world where you just don't seem to fit in. It's like, you got to remember who you are. Remember who you are. And he starts here, and this is dense theologically, so we're going to break this down quite a bit. we got a lot of ground to cover here. But here's 1 Peter, um, the second verse of chapter 1. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Now, just on a, like a like a macro level here. You see what's happening here in the very beginning of First Peter? He says that God is community. God is the Trinity. There's God the Father, there's God the Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus, who's doing all this incredible stuff to remind you of who you are. Sorry, I just think that's really, really cool, and I'm a geek, but we'll move on from there. But he begins with, God the Father knew you. And this language of knowing, it's it's intimate language. It's where there's nothing hidden between you and the person who knows you at all. And he starts here by saying, God the Father knew you. 
You know, there's, there's a lie you might be- believe about yourself is that God is way up there and the world is down here and he doesn't really know what's going on in my immediate uh, life and in my heart and in my spirit. But Peter starts by saying, no, 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 you need to remember, like, this is what is true about your identity. God the Father intimately knows you. He knows the things that you like about yourself. He knows the things that you want to hide about yourself to others. He knows your motivations, which is really annoying, and he knows all of your behavior. He knows you on an intimate level. Like you know the cry of your child if you're a parent. Like you know the laughter of your child as a parent. Your heavenly father knows you deeply like that. And that is a powerful reality of your identity. And Peter, he knew this better than we could possibly imagine. There's one narrative that happens in the Gospels where Peter actually even denies knowing who Jesus is. He says, I don't, Jesus, never heard of this guy because uh, it looked like Jesus was going down as a failed Messiah. Never heard of him. And so Peter denies Jesus. They actually have this dramatic moment where Jesus makes eye contact with Peter after Peter denied him the third time. And then Peter runs away in shame. Because he even denied knowing Jesus. Flash forward three days later and Jesus is resurrected. And what's amazing is that uh, Peter actually sees Jesus on the beach when Peter's in a boat. And Peter just reflexively jumps out of the boat to go meet Jesus. But I imagine halfway through his swim, he's like, oh crap. The last time I saw this guy, I denied even knowing him. I imagine there was this like really intense moment where he realized halfway through swimming to the shore that he's going to get a lecture from Jesus. He's going to get a finger wag from Jesus because he denied even knowing who Jesus was. But did Jesus give him a lecture? Did Jesus scold him? No. You know what Jesus did? He made Peter breakfast. And he says, you are my beloved, Peter. I love you. That's the first thing he said. Jesus knew how Peter would deny him and he didn't matter because he knows him deeply and he still loves him. Next, we're told here that God the Father knew you and he chose you long ago. He chose you long ago. Maybe for you, the lie that you believe about your identity is that, you know, you're just rejected by everybody. Maybe at work from a boss, maybe from a relationship. Maybe you feel rejected from your kids or having friends and you feel alone, but you've just been rejected. Maybe that's the label that you have over your story. Peter says, no, I want you to know the deepest truth about who you are, that you are chosen. And you weren't chosen on a whim, but you were chosen long ago to be in relationship with this heavenly father. The language of chosen here is adoption language. Isn't adoption one of the more beautiful things that we see in our world today? Isn't it? I know we've got adoption stories in the room this morning. I'm sure watching online. But man, there's nothing that like speaks of the truth, the reality of the gospel more than adoption to me. It's this idea that this child doesn't have to perform, doesn't have to clean themselves up, doesn't have to make sure that they're going to be a good investment for you in the future before you pick them up and welcome them into your family. No, it is all in the kindness of the adoptive parents saying, come, arms wide open, all of your mess, all of your brokenness, all of your possible mess, all of your possible brokenness, you are part of our family No holds barred. You're in with us. This is what Peter is reminding them. He's saying, hey, you have been chosen. You have not been rejected. Rejection is not your first name, but chosen is your first name. You have been selected by the God of the universe. Remember who you are. You have been chosen by the God of the universe. Peter moves on to what the Holy Spirit does here. He says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. Maybe for you, you hear that phrase, the Spirit has made you holy, and you're like, that might be true for somebody. That is not true for my life at all. Holiness is not like the descriptor over my life. Because the reality is many times when we see the word holy in the Bible or any kind of song or religious language, we think that's reserved for God and I'm a hot mess express and not holiness at all because I've got mistakes in my life, I've got brokenness in my life. But there's a deeper reality to holiness that Peter's bringing out here. Holiness is not about staying away from the wrong things and only doing the right things. Holiness is about being set apart. It's saying like having a certain status in your life. And Peter says that the Spirit has made you holy. The Spirit has set you apart, made you other. Not because of your behavior, but because of what the Spirit says about you, the label that the Spirit puts on your life. I, when I think about this like label thing, like we don't think that we're holy, but God calls us holy. I think about anybody who played with Michael Jordan in the 1990s. 
Any, uh, Michael Jordan, let's put this picture up. This is Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and, and then there's this other guy by the name of Joe Klein sitting on the bench, and the awkward guy taking a picture that I'm just now noticing um, below them. <laughs> Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, like no questions here. We can debate later, and I will win. Um, <laughs> The greatest basketball player ever, Scottie Pippen, Hall of Famer, incredible player. And then you see this guy, Joe Klein. Now, I learned about Joe Klein this week. Joe Klein is, uh, by Bulls fans, considered the worst player to ever play on a championship team. Uh, Joe Klein averaged less than five minutes a game. He averaged less than two points a game, and he averaged uh, less than two rebounds, but he averaged three fouls. So way to go, Joe Klein, right? You'd say all of his identity and the way that people think about him playing basketball is that he was not very good at all. And I can't imagine the berating that MJ gave him during practices. You might think that. But you know the deepest reality about Joe Klein? Is that Joe Klein is a champion. Joe Klein's got a ring, y'all. It doesn't matter how he performed, how much he uh, could do individually, but he was on a championship team and he is an NBA champion forever. This is the reality that in a deeper sense that I want you to understand about what the Spirit says about you and your identity, that you are holy, you are set apart, and it has nothing to do with your behavior, but it's about God's love and action that sets you apart and says that you are holy. He calls you holy one. Maybe instead of saying holiness is I've got to stop doing this and do more of this, stop doing this, do more of this, maybe it's beginning with just you reminding yourself and being reminded that God has called you. And God has chosen you, and he knows you, and he set you apart. Maybe if you live with that label, you might look more like Jesus at the end of the day. But that's a whole other message for a whole other time. But he says the Spirit makes you holy. Later on, in the very next verse, we see here where Jesus enters the picture. And he says that and you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is strange language to us, to be cleansed by the blood. But this is us, you know, Peter hearkening back to the reality of what Jesus did at the cross, that you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe the lie that you're believing about yourself is that you've got to clean yourself up. Like, you know there's brokenness in your life, and you know that there's stains on your life, and you feel like you just got to clean yourself up. you got to read one more self-help book. Uh, you've got to, uh, you know, wake up in the morning and start a new habit, start a new reality in your life, and that's the way that you'll clean yourself up. Let me just tell you, like, the beauty of the invitation of the gospel in Jesus is that we don't clean ourselves up, and we can't clean ourselves up, but Jesus went to the cross to clean us up. This is the reality that this vicarious substitution that Jesus did at the cross, that we get cleaned up in the process of his death, we get cleaned up. And you might not feel like it, but Jesus is the one that you trust him to clean you up. Now, you guys, this is a scandalous thing, not only for the ancient world, but for, for, for us. Because our whole lives, we've lived our lives trying to be graded, ranked, assessed, and judged so that we can receive things, Right? But the beauty of what Jesus did for us is that he did it for us. And our identity and our cleanliness is not achieved, it's received. Our identity is not achieved by what we do, it is received because the Spirit cleans us up. Into the next verse here. <laughs> All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by the great mercy, his great mercy, that we have been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. This born again language, again, is family language here, being born into. You know, maybe the lie that you're believing is, you know, my life would be different if I was born into a different biological family. I mean, my family's got mess. We put the fun in dysfunctional family, if you know what I mean. And man, if I just had a different family, oh, my life would be different and I'd be like much happier and filled with more joy. Maybe I'd be more religious or spiritual. You, I hear that kind of thing all the time. But here's the reality of what Peter's telling us about our identity is that because of what Jesus has done, if you accept what Jesus has done for you, you are born into a new family. Because of Jesus, the whole world is reshaped and you've been given a new identity with this family called the church, the Jesus people, a group of misfits, crazy people, liars, hot mess expresses, but everyone's welcome into this family and everybody is accepted because of what Jesus had done. You're born again into a new family where the word is not no, but the word is come and be changed and experience life. 
been born again. He continues on in the next part of this verse. Uh, He says this, now we live with great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. When I think about inheritance, I remember when I was like in uh, like fifth, sixth grade. I don't know if you guys remember this, but Beanie Babies were all the rage. Anybody remember Beanie Babies? Oh, yeah, because I remember thinking at the time, I'm just going to collect all the Beanie Babies, and then I won't have to pay for college, my kids' college. I'm just going to buy a house. I'm going to be loaded when I'm like 30 because I collected Beanie Babies, and they're just going to go up and to the right like Dogecoin or Bitcoin uh, uh, with like, like their wealth and their worth, right? Well, they're not worth anything today, so I really missed out on the boat there. But, but Peter is saying here, uh, man, you have been given this inheritance, this life with God, this life united with God forever that's kept in heaven. But this beautiful inheritance, it's worth more than Beanie Babies. It's worth more than gold. It's worth more than a couple Bitcoin or whatever you can possibly imagine. Those things will fade. They'll slip away. They'll go up and down. This inheritance will never end, and it's stored for you in heaven. It is stored for you in heaven. Next, Peter says this, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Maybe a lie you're believing about your identity is that you're on your own. You've got to fend for yourself, and the world's not the way it should be, but you've got to just like keep your guard up, play defense all the time, and protect yourself. Peter says, no, I want you to understand that in your identity, you are protected by the God of the cosmos. The word in the original language used for protected is the word frueo. You guys with me? Can we say frueo on the count of three together? One, two, three. Frueo. Yeah, that's, that's a fun word to say. Um, but here's the reality of the word frueo. Frueo, this idea of protecting, it was a military term. It means to be protected by a military guard to prevent hostile invasion or takeover. God says in your identity, you have been given this heavenly army, this battalion that's going to protect you. And this world might leave you bruised, but this world will not leave you with a knockout punch at all because you are frueo. You are protected by God's power and who God is. That's who you are. And then we get to the so that section. Peter's been giving us this onslaught of this identity language, reminding you of who you are. But Peter starts to tell you why it matters so much while you're living in this in-between, already not yet, exile period of time. He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He's saying at the very beginning here that there's, there's purpose in your pain, Hold on. You can actually be happy because God's doing something in you as you suffer in this season. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know what Peter's saying here? If you're going through your in-between period, your exile period of your life, if you're living in this already not yet reality, do you know how uh, you get better and stronger? Is you don't hit the eject button on your faith and in your trust and of you understanding your identity. Hold on. Because God does something in these hard moments when you hold on. He does something to grow you, to strengthen you, to show the genuineness of your faith. Let me ask you a question. Who are the people that their faith stories inspire you the most? Who inspires you the most with their faith stories? Are they people who their life has just been amazing? They were born with a silver spoon and they kept the silver spoon and their life has been up and to the right all the way through and then they can say at the end of the day, God is good. Do those inspire you? They don't inspire me. (laughs) You know, the faith stories that inspire me are the people that have been to hell and back. They've been at the bottom of the barrel and they've only had one thing to do is just to scream help and they hung in there, and they saw God rescue them over and over again. And then they just want to tell people about how God rescued them from the bottom. Those are the stories that inspire me. Those are the faith stories that inspire you. And Peter's saying, you'll have a faith story like that, an inspiring faith story, if you remember who you are. God will grow you, and you'll have an inspiring story that will help others if you remember who you are. So two simple challenges based off of this I want to leave us with. The first is this. Let God remind you of who you are. I love Andy Stanley says this. Take your cue from the one who created you. Don't look to your left or your right for your identity to remember who you are. 
but let God remind you of who you are. This means that we can't let our phones remind us of who we are and the screens that we see, the news sources we see, Facebook to remind us of who we are, a text message that we're waiting for that's gonna change the trajectory of our day. Instead of letting these things and other people's voices that are shouting at us, telling us who we are, we need to let God remind us of who we are, connect vertically with him. And you guys, this is where maybe letting the first words that we hear in the morning be God's, the scriptures, instead of the news, instead of what we see on social media, instead of looking at our calendar for the day, man, it will reshape you. And I know I say this all the time, but I'm just going to keep banging that drum. Let the first thing you hear about yourself in the morning be what God says about you and God's truth, and it will reshape the way you see yourself and your whole world. Let God remind you of who you are. This, can, this might be in the music you listen to. This might be in the media that you consume. But don't get your identity from any other place, but let God remind you of who you are. And here's the second thing, and it might sound counterintuitive, but it's not. Let others remind you of who you are. And when I say others, I don't mean just anybody, because that's like against what we've talked about for the last 30 minutes. But let others, people that are your running partners, people that have that inspiring faith story, people that are trying to follow Jesus, let them remind you of who you are. Let them speak into you truth when life is too hazy in front of you and you don't know what steps to take. Man, God uses people to remind me of who I am all the time, and he'll do the same for you. That's why we believe in group life so much here at Bridgeway and getting into circles, not just sitting in rows, so we can be reminded from others of who we really are because we know that they're running in the same direction that we are. I remember I was in a life transition just two years ago, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. I had some options around the country, um, in different parts of the Midwest. And I'm like, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Um, I just felt like I needed to get out of Kokomo. I needed to just start over, dream it all up again was kind of the thing. And I remember I got a phone call from a, a couple who uh, attend the church here. And they were asking me how they could pray for me, didn't know what my next step was. And they, they spoke into me in that phone call. And they just told me, Joel, you, you need to like lead a church. You need to preach. You have a voice. You need to do something with this And I remember they said, don't run away from who God created you to be. I'll never forget those words. And I hung up the phone, and I was mad because I didn't want to hear it. You have those? And I started crying because I felt like God was speaking through it. But I'll tell you, when my life was so hazy and I didn't know where I was supposed to go next to have somebody remind me of who God created me to be, man, it was like clarifying and it was forging in my life. And I'm so grateful for people like that. And I want people... I want you to have people like that in your life as well. People to remind you of who you are. Let God remind you and let others that are running in this faith journey with you remind you of who you are as well. My friends, whatever exile, whatever in-between season, no matter how you're living in this already but not yet reality, um, God wants you to thrive. And it begins not by you doing more, by staying away from certain things. No, it begins with you remembering who God says you are and your identity.